The Challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you, Huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was returning from patrol one morning and was mushing along the trail bordering Venture Creek. His great lead dog, Yukon King, was running ahead of the team as loose lead. In the distance stood a small cabin. Suddenly, King increased his speed and sprinted forward. What's up, fella? Then the sergeant saw what had attracted King's attention. It was a body lying in the snow in front of the cabin. Oh, you husky! Oh, ho, oh, ho! Oh. It's a girl, King. The sergeant raised her head and pushed back the hood of her parka. The girl was young, not more than 19 or 20 at the most. Her face was deathly pale, and her cheeks were hollow. She's still alive, King. I'd better carry her into the cabin. As the sergeant laid her down on the bunk, the girl's eyes flickered open. Who are you? Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. I found you lying unconscious in front of the cabin. Oh, I see. Thank you, Sergeant. I'm Mrs. Redford, Anita Redford. What happened? I was feeling quite ill a while ago. I thought perhaps if I went outside and got some fresh air, well, I might feel better. Yes, I fainted. How do you feel now? All right. Quite all right. Where's your husband? He went out hunting. Look, uh... How long has it been since you've eaten? Why, I, I don't know what you mean. I... Tell me the truth. You're right. What's the point of lying? I haven't eaten since yesterday morning. You stay right there. I'll fix you some food. The sergeant went out to his sled and returned with an armful of his own supplies. Then he fixed Mrs. Radford a nourishing meal. When she was through, she turned to him with an embarrassed smile. I can't tell you how grateful I am. It's terribly embarrassing to have to accept charity. Charity has nothing to do with it. A country like this, a person gives help when he can, accepts it when he needs it. I suppose that's the common sense attitude. Of course it is. Is your husband's claim played out? Well, I'm afraid so. He never did get much gold out of it. Only a few hundred dollars worth. We spent the last of that two weeks ago. I don't mean to be inquisitive, but what are your plans? Well, to tell you the truth, we don't have any. Where did our wits end? Chris has tried to get a job in Dawson or at one of the mines, but so far he hasn't had any luck. Oh. When I get back to town, I'll ask around, see if I can turn up anything for him. Oh, we'll certainly be grateful if you can. Oh, that must be Chris now. Nita, what's wrong? Oh, nothing, Chris. I'm all right. I just fainted out in front of the cabin, that's all. Oh. Sergeant Preston brought me inside. I'm mighty thankful you happened along, Sergeant. I'm Chris Radford. Glad to know you, Chris. Did you have any luck hunting? No, none at all. I uh, brought in some supplies. You'd better have something to eat. Thanks, but there's no need for charity. I told him the truth, Chris. Oh, well, don't look so pained. Everybody shares his supplies up here. It's an unwritten law. You've probably fed more than one traveler yourself. Of course we have. I doubt if there's a sourdough in the Yukon who hasn't been down on his luck at some time or another. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I suppose you're right. Chris... Your face seems very familiar. Hadn't we met before? Not that I know of, Sergeant. You may have caught a glimpse of me in Dawson sometime. Sergeant Preston says he's going to inquire around and see if he can locate a job for you, Chris. Oh, that'll be the biggest favor you can do me, Sergeant. I'll do my best. Where do you folks come from? The States. Philadelphia, to be exact. Do you have parents or any other relatives who might help you? None that I know of. Nita's an orphan, and my mother died last year just before we came to the Yukon. What about your father? Dad left Mother when I was a kid. And you don't know where to locate him? No. He never saw him again after he left. And if I did know where to locate him, I still wouldn't ask for help. Not even if he were a millionaire. I see. Well, we'll see if we can find you a job. 
In the meantime, those supplies on the table there will last you for a week or so. You've been mighty kind, Sergeant. You certainly have. Still wish I knew why your face seems so familiar, Chris. <laughs> well, maybe it'll come to you by the time you get back to town. Maybe so. Come along, King. Goodbye, Sergeant. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'll drop back again in a few days. Let's go, boy. <laughs> When Sergeant Preston arrived back at headquarters, he was told to report to Inspector Conrad. Come in. Oh, it's you, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Constable Ross said you wanted to see me. Yes, I have a new assignment for you. Rather a vague assignment, I'm afraid. The American authorities on Alaska just sent us a warning about a dangerous gang led by a man called Hawk Webster. They're in the territory? Yes, apparently they slipped over the border about a week ago. Do you have pictures of the gang, sir? No, Sergeant, that's the trouble. All we have to go on are some very brief descriptions. Here, you can take the report and study it. Oh, very well, sir. Oh, uh, while I'm here, there's something I'd like to speak to you about, sir. Uh, go ahead, Sergeant. Do you know the man they call Klondike Jack? Uh, certainly. He's the owner of the Spread Eagle Cafe. Does he have a police record? Uh, yes, we have him covered in our files. He served time in the States for train robbery. Then later on, he got in trouble in Alaska, received a one-year sentence. However, he's never given us any trouble here in the Territory. Do you know his real name? Yes, it's Jackson Radford. Radford. Does that mean something to you? This morning, I met a young fellow out on Venture Creek named Chris Radford. His face seemed familiar, but I couldn't place him. And later on, I realized he's almost a double for Klondike Jack. They're probably related. I believe they're father and son. Chris told me he hasn't seen his father in years. Doesn't know where he's located. What's the reason for your interest, Sergeant? Chris and his wife are practically destitute, sir. His claim's played out, and he can't find a job. Well, Klondike Jack can certainly afford to help them out. He's making a fortune out of his cafe. Trouble is, Chris won't accept help from him. Feels very bitter toward his father. Hmm. Well, at least you can let them know about each other. Perhaps you can bring them together, Sergeant. I'll do my best, sir. At that moment, Klondike Jack was seated in his office at the rear of the Spread Eagle Cafe. He was talking to a visitor, a gaunt, cruel-looking man with a beak-like nose and a scar across one cheekbone. The visitor was the outlaw, Hawk Webster. Jack was saying, Why... I thought you and your gang were still operating in Alaska. What in thunder are you doing here in Dawson? A United States Marshal got on our trail and started making things hot for us. So we decided to look for happier hunting grounds. What did you come to me for? Well, it's like this, Jack. Me and the boys are a little short of cash right now. We figured we might work out a deal with you. Yeah? What kind of a deal? With a layout like this, you're in a position to pick up lots of useful information. Mm, such as? Well, for instance, a miner comes into your cafe. He starts to enjoy himself, shoots off his mouth. You find out he struck it rich. Got a whole heap of gold stored away back in his cabin. All right? You pass the word to us. And, and we... you follow him back to his cabin and swipe his gold. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh. I'm not interested. Now, look, Jack. Use your head. I am using my head. That's why I'm turning you down. I have been going straight ever since I hit the Yukon Territory. I aim to keep on going straight. Oh, wait a minute. Come on in. Boss, Sergeant Preston here wants to talk to you. Okay, send him in. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who's this Sergeant Preston? He's a money. That's what I figured. Look, how about hiding me somewhere around here till he clears out? What's the matter? He's never seen you. That marshal may have sent my description to the Mounties. All right. Uh, get in that closet over there and keep quiet. He probably won't be here long. Okay. Hurry up and get rid of him. All right. Send him in, Sam. Right, boss. A moment later, Sergeant Preston entered the office. Howdy, Sarge. Hello, Jack. Have a chair. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> what's on your mind? Jack... I believe you used to have a family once upon a time. Yeah, I guess maybe I did. How'd you know? Any idea what happened to them? Oh, I, I wrote my wife a couple of years after I left her, but I got no reply. Later on, I went back, but they were gone, moved somewhere else. Couldn't trace them. I see. What are you driving at, Preston? Do you know anything about them? Suppose I do. Well, then, for the love of Mike, man, hurry up and tell me. Well, what about my wife? Is she all right? She died last year. Died? She died? I'm sorry, Jack. Well, what about my boy? 
that he didn't know where to locate you, and if he did, he still wouldn't accept help from you, even if you were a millionaire. Oh, it's like that, eh? I'm afraid so, Jack. If there's anything I can do to patch things up between you, I'll certainly do it. Well, thanks, Sarge. I appreciate that. I appreciate it a lot. But let me try to talk to him first. No, right, Jack, you do that. This cabin's about halfway up the creek. There's a big boulder on the bank of the creek right in front of it. Mm-hmm. You can't miss it. Oh, I'll find it, all right. Let me know how you make out. I sure will, Sergeant. And I am plenty grateful to you for telling me about my boy. Come along, King. <laughs> so long, Sarge. Bye, Jack. Finally got rid of him, Jack. Yes, he's gone, if that's what you mean. Now, about that proposition I was offering you. You changed your mind, huh? No, I haven't. As far as I'm concerned, you can clear out right now. And don't come back. Sure. Sure, I'll clear out. But you know, I got a hunch you may be sorry you passed up my offer. Klondike Jack started out for Venture Creek. It was late afternoon when he arrived at Chris's cabin. Oh! Hello, Chris. Uh, well, aren't you going to ask me in? What do you want? I'd like to talk to you. All right. Nita, this is my father. How do you do? Well, so you're my daughter-in-law. Uh, come here and let me look at you. By thunder, you're as pretty as a picture. <laughs> as pretty as Chris's ma was when she was your age. How did you know we were living here? Sergeant Preston told me. You look just like your father, Chris. That's why Sergeant Preston kept saying your face seemed so familiar. Yeah, I guess he must have figured it out after he left here. I reckon so. Well, now that you're here, what do you want with me? I, I want to help you, son. I don't want your help. Uh, listen to me, Chris. I know you hate me. I don't blame you. But maybe I'm not quite as bad as you think. You ran off and left Mother to starve, didn't you? I wrote to her and I tried to find you later on. You were gone. I couldn't trace you. You could have if you'd tried hard enough. I reckon it's no use trying to excuse myself. I've done wrong, Chris. I know that. But I've paid for it. Believe me, I've paid for it. How can't you let bygones be bygones? No, I can't. If you'd seen what Mother went through, you'd know why. Chris, don't you think you're being a little too hard? No, I don't. But I want to help you, son. You need money, all right. I've got money, lots of it. You can have it all. Thanks. But I'll get along without your help. That's your final word? Yes. That's my final word. All right, I can understand how you feel. If that's the way it's got to be, I'll clear out. But if you should change your mind, well, I'll sure be glad to see you. You can find me at the Spread Eagle Cafe in Dawson. Just ask for Klondike Jack. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good luck to both of you. Both Chris and Anita were silent for a long time after Chris's father had left the cabin. But later that evening, Chris burst out with the thoughts that were uppermost in his mind. You blame me, don't you, for turning Dad away as I did? Of course I don't blame you, Chris. I can understand how you feel. Just the same? You think I was too harsh with him? I do think he's sorry for the past, and he's terribly unhappy. He wants to make it up to you any way that he can. What you mean is he wants to buy me off. He thinks he can salve his conscience with money. It's the only way he has to make up for what happened. Yeah, yeah, I know. And in the meantime, I'm broke. I can't support you properly. Can't even feed oh, you. Oh, please don't talk that way, Chris. Things are bad right now, but they won't always be like this. You'll find a job and Yeah, then... maybe. What's going to happen if I don't? Someone's at the door. I'll answer it. Howdy. You're Chris Radford, ain't you? That's right. I'd like to talk to you about something. Oh, come on in. Are you alone? Well, my wife's here. Then maybe we'd better talk outside. What I got to say is private. Oh, well, what's this all about? If you need money, it'll be worth your while to listen. All right. Wait a second till I get my coat. Sure. Who is it, Chris? I don't know. He wants to talk to me outside. I won't be too long. All 
right. What's on your mind? How'd you like to pick up 5,000 bucks? 5,000 bucks? For doing what? Wearing a handkerchief over your face and holding a gun. What's that? Now, see here, mister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simmer down a minute and listen to me, will you? Here's the idea. Tomorrow night, I'm aiming to rob a cafe in Dawson. You must be crazy coming to me with a proposition like that. Look, I'm not asking you to take any risks or do any of the dirty work. And what are you asking? Well, if you listen, I'll tell you. There's four of us going to stage this hold up. Be a big job. We need one more man to pull the thing off right. Meaning me? Yeah, meaning you. But your part will be easy. All you have to do is go in with the rest of us, stand there with a gun in your hand, just help keep the customers covered. That's all. Me and the boys will handle all the details and take care of any trouble that comes up. How did you find out about me? <laughs> What's the difference? Point is, I heard you were broken up against it. So naturally, I thought you might be interested in picking up some easy money. And maybe winding up in prison. Ah, don't be crazy. This job's a cinch. What's more, I'm offering you 5,000 bucks. That's guaranteed. If your share comes a more, that you'll get more. $5,000? You make it sound mighty easy. Sure, because it is easy. I'm telling you, Radford, come in with us on this job and you won't regret it. Uh, no, I I can't do it. You'd rather stay honest and starve to death, is that it? Well, what if I would? That's my business, isn't it? Look, maybe you don't mind starving out here, but what about your wife? You suppose it's any fun for her? It's not my fault if I can't find a job. It'll be your fault if you don't get her out of this mess. Listen, you can do a lot with 5,000 bucks, Radford. It'll take you back to the States in style. Back to where you can find a job, give your wife the kind of life she deserves. Hey, I... All right, I'll do it. I'll go in with you. Now you're talking sense. It was late at night when Hawk Webster returned to the cabin on the outskirts of Dawson, which he and the other three members of his gang were using as a hideout. From the evil grin on his face as he stepped into the cabin, his three henchmen could tell that his mission had been a success. Yeah. Looks like you got what you went after, Hawk. Sure I did. You mean uh, young Radford's coming in with us on the holdup? That's right. I promised him 5,000 bucks and he couldn't resist. <laughs> Not that he'll ever see that 5,000. Hey, it's sure going to be funny when Jack finds out his own son's helping to rob the cafe. Hey, it'll be funny, all right, but Jack won't be laughing. He'll know who robbed him, but he won't dare give us away for fear his own kid might get caught. Well, really have him strapped, huh? Yeah, and that ain't all. Besides the boodle we get from the holdup, we'll be able to blackmail Jack from then on. You mean about his kid? Sure. Either Jack pays off or we send the Mounties a note telling them that young Chris Radford took part in the holdup. Yeah, but if we do that, the kid will squeal on us himself. Well, let him squeal. The Mounties will have to catch us before they can do anything to us. And besides, we won't have to worry about that. Jack will pay off fast enough when it's a question of his own kid going to jail. Yeah, by Thunderhawk... You figured out some slick deals in your day, but this job's the slickest of them all. What time's young Radford gonna show up? He's gonna meet us here at the cabin tomorrow night around 10 o'clock. Then we'll give him an empty gun and head for the cafe. The following evening, Sergeant Preston came to Chris Radford's cabin on Venture Creek. Halting! Hold your Come along, then. Hello, Mrs. Radford. Take off your parka, Sergeant, and sit down. Why, thanks. I won't bother to take off my parka. I can't stay long. The reason I came was to talk to Chris about his father. Have you seen him? Oh, Chris's father, I mean. Yes, he told me about the talk he had with Chris yesterday. Asked me to intercede with Chris, see if I couldn't help bring them together. Oh, I wish you could, Sergeant. Where is Chris? I guess he's in town. Frankly, I'm quite worried about him. Why so? Well, he left early this morning and said he'd be coming right back. Said his business in town wouldn't take more than 15 or 20 minutes at the most. He still hasn't come back. Do you know what he intended to do in town? No. No, I don't. That's partly why I'm so worried. Well, what do you mean? Well, last night a stranger came to see Chris. He wouldn't come in because I was here. He asked Chris to step outside and talk to him. You have no idea who he was? No, I just caught a brief glimpse of him in the doorway. Ah, go on. Well... After he left, Chris seemed very disturbed. He wouldn't tell me what they talked about. All night long, he turned and tossed and hardly slept a wink. Then this morning, he seemed a lot quieter and steadier, as though he'd come to some decision. And that's when he told me he was going into town. 
Well, if you're seriously worried, I can have my dog trail him. Do you think he could find him? I'm quite sure he could. He's the best tracker in the territory. Then I wish you would, Sergeant. Maybe I'm being foolish, but it would relieve my mind a lot. We'll need a piece of clothing that Chris has worn recently. That'll give King his scent. All right, Sergeant. I'll get something right away. Several hours later, four men gathered in the darkness behind the Spread Eagle Cafe. The leader of the group was Hawk Webster. Now, you all got your handkerchiefs tied in place? Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. All right, boys, here's how we work it. Deuce, you slip in the back way. Corral everybody in sight. Make sure that no one gets out to spread the alarm. Right, boss. The rest of us will go in the front door and cover all the customers. From then on, I'll give the orders. Now, do you savvy? You got your yeah, sure. I'll get your guns out. All set? Sure. Yep. All right, let's go. Leaving Deuce behind, the other three crooks advanced toward the front of the cafe. Before emerging from the shadows, they halted for a moment and watched the passers-by in the street. Then, when he was satisfied that all was clear, Hawk gave the signal to rush toward the front door. All right, boys. Now. Reach! Charlie, it's a hold-up! Look, best man! Three of them, I'll fix them! I got him, boss. Any more you want a dose of the same medicine? All right, then keep your hands high and don't go reaching for your gun. Hey, what's the next move, boss? You stay here by the door, keep them covered. Red, you move around among the tables, grab their pokes. Right. I'll go back in the office and see you about the cat. All right, thank you. Circling around the tables, Hawk Webster made his way past the bar and through a doorway leading to the rear of the cafe. There he found Klondike Jack and several right. employees standing with their hands in the air as Deuce covered them with his gun. I've got everything under control, boss. Good work, Deuce. What? Why, you dirty pole cat? I know who Shut you Shut up, Rouse, will you? Now start walking towards your office. Why? Deuce, you stay here and watch this bunch. All right. All right, get moving, Redford. You... Now open the door and go in. My thunder, Hawk. You won't get away with this. Oh, so you recognize me, huh? Certainly I recognized you. You can't disguise that voice of yours with a handkerchief over your face. I'll have the Mounties on your trail ten minutes after you leave here. Oh, no, you won't, Jack. When the Mounties come around to investigate this holdup, you're going to tell them you haven't got the slightest idea who we were. Are you crazy? No, far from it. You see one of the boys out front who's robbing your customers right now happens to be a young fella named Chris Radford. What's that? Yeah, Chris Radford. That kid of yours that need money so badly. <laughs> You squeal on me to the Mounties and you'll be sending your own son to prison. You filthy scum. I don't like to be called names like that. You better lay off or I might start squeezing this trigger. Now hurry up and get that safe open. Helpless to resist in the face of Hawk Webster's leveled gun, Klondike Jack obeyed the order and opened his office safe. Then Hawk produced a bag which he had been carrying under his parka and forced the cafe owner to stuff into it the gold and currency which had been stored in the safe. When he was All through, right, Hawk that. took the bag from him and told him to open the door leading out into the corridor. All right, get going. Now get your hands up again and stand right where you are. Still keeping the cafe owner covered with his gun, Hawk backed out into the corridor. Hey, Deuce. Yeah, boss? Heard the rest of those Jaspers into the office here, along with Klondike Jack. We'll lock them in. Okay. Get moving, you guys. Come on. Uh, Come on inside, all of you. That'll hold them for a while. We make our getaway. Now what? Come on. Go back out front again and see how Red and Snag are making out with the customers. <laughs> we sure pulled this job off slick, eh, Hawk? Hey, what's going on out there? Oh, we'll soon find out. Oh, there hey, they are, It's the Mounties. They've got Red and Snag. Come on, we got to get out of here. Slamming the door that led to the front of the cafe, Hawk and Deuce turned and ran toward the back door. But Sergeant Preston came charging after them. Up in the name of the crown! Deuce had just reached the back door as the Mountie closed in on them. Both crooks had holstered their guns, but Hawk turned and tried to draw. Now snap your Preston! No, you don't! The sergeant ah. left at Hawk and brought him down with a flying tackle. Seeing his leader's plight, Deuce paused and jerked out his gun. Him, but before he could fire at the sergeant, a great dog sprang through the open doorway. Ah. The gun flew from Deuce's hand as he went down under King's sudden attack. Meanwhile, Hawk and the sergeant were trading savage blows at short range. As Hawk weakened under Sergeant Preston's terrific punishment, he suddenly stopped punching and grabbed the Mountie around the throat. Don't suffer a life out of you, Preston! In answer, the sergeant let go a series of hard rights and lefts no, to the head. No. That enough? Yeah, yeah, enough. I quit. Get up on your feet, then. I quit, too, Preston. Get this dog away from me. Get him away! All right, King. I'll handle him now, boy. Up on your feet, mister. Alongside your partner there. You're both under arrest in the name of the Crown. 
After handcuffing his prisoners, Sergeant Preston released Klondike Jack and the other persons who had been locked in the office. Klondike's expression was tense and worried as he faced the sergeant. I suppose you captured Chris, eh, Sergeant? No, Jack, I didn't. You mean he got away? I mean he didn't take part in the holdup. In fact, it was due to him that we were able to prevent it. But Hawk said he was out front helping the gang. He was lying. Last night, Hawk persuaded Chris to help rob a cafe because he needed money so badly. Chris didn't know it was your cafe, and anyway, he had a change of heart overnight. Came to town this morning and told Hawk he wasn't going through with it. The gang captured him, was holding him prisoner. Hawk was simply bluffing when he told you Chris was taking part in this robbery. Sergeant, how come you found all this out? When I went to Chris's cabin this evening, his wife was worried because he hadn't returned home. I put King on his trail and tracked him to the crook's hideout. And Chris told you what Hawk and his gang were up to, is that it? That's right. We came straight here from the hideout and picked up a constable on the way. Oh, that sure takes a load off my mind. Knowing my boy won't have to go to prison. Oh, here he comes now, Jack. I think he has something to say to you. Hello there, Chris. Hello, Dad. I... I'm wondering if you still want to be friends with me after the way I talked last night. <laughs> Don't be foolish, son. I told you I didn't blame you for feeling the way you did. There's nothing in the world I want more than to be friends with you and, and your wife. I... Uh, uh, how about, how about shaking hands on that, Dad? By thunder, Chris. Sure makes me happy to hear you say that. And, uh, listen, you're going to let me help you out now, aren't you? You won't have to help him out, Jack. Well, what do you mean, sir? There's a $5,000 reward for the capture of Hawk Webster and his gang. That reward will be paid to Chris just as soon as this case is closed. We now take you to Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson. You sent for me, Inspector? Yes, Sergeant Preston, I did. I suggest that on your patrol duty to Selkirk, you stop and investigate the deserted settlement of Beaverton. There are reports that strange happenings are taking place there, in spite of the fact that it's a ghost town. Very well, Inspector. King and I will start that way this afternoon. Come on, King. <laughs> Yes, Sergeant Preston will investigate Beaverton. But it may be that he and King will find that they've come up against a great deal more than they bargained for. They might even find themselves in a death trap. Be sure to listen to this next exciting adventure, The Beaverton Legacy. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you once each week until September, when we shall resume our regular Monday, Wednesday, and Friday broadcasts. <laughs> This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next broadcast. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.